Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of San Antonio, whether online or on broadcast, in your homes or wherever you may be. We want you to know that you are more than welcome to be a part of the life of this church, and we want you to know that we want you to meet Jesus today. In order for this to happen regularly, we need your support, we need your prayers, and we need your financial gifts. Please continue to give and be a part of what we do today. Today, as Pastor Aaron alluded to, we began our new Bible study series, uh, Approaching the Cross. We'll move from the manger to the crucifixion in these days. And so today, our reverse text is John 18, verses 15 through 18 and 25 through 27. You'll find that on your listening sheet, and we're going to read this aloud together. So if you'll find that, stand with me, and we'll read. This then is the text for today. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, And so they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. May God bless the reading of his word. Stories become sanitized over time. It's rarely intentional that this happens, but it's so. As we tell a story, it becomes more concise. It sort of erodes away. And the more often we hear the details, the duller they become time after time. What was once a vivid depiction in our imagination becomes an old story that we've always heard. And that raises the level of difficulty for the church in the season of Advent. We tell the same story again. The same story we've always heard gets brought up week in and week out. So how are we, together as a church, going to tell this story? How are we going to tell the story of the birth of Jesus Christ in radiant color? One of the things that we're going to do this year in that way is we're going to tell the why. So we begin in the manger. And as we begin in the manger, the why always matters. Why did this baby come? What was Jesus Christ doing in this birth? Why would God have to be born into this fleshly, physical world? And so for that why, to understand the why of the manger scene, we have to fast forward. And for the Christ, we have to fast forward all the way to the end of the story. And so as we tell the beginning, we are to point to its end. And so all through this Advent season, we will be walking with Jesus towards the cross in the Gospel of John. And we find the similar complication, that we have the same story now that we tell every Easter. How will we tell that story anew? in the light of the birth of Jesus Christ, as the angels sing of the incarnation, how will we talk about the crucifixion? What we want to do together in these weeks as we approach the cross from the manger 
is burrow down into the details of the narrative. The, the details of the story help us reimagine these stories, to, to bring them to life again, to see the stories as they happen. We're going to note the particulars that we often overlook when we read a story for the 75th time. Let me give you one example that happened to me as I was studying this week. As I was preparing uh, the story of Peter's denials, I came across a fact that I don't ever remember considering before. It came from one commentary in particular, Bob Utley, who noted that this rooster that crows around 3 a.m. that morning was a Roman rooster. I laughed when I read that this week, picturing this rooster running around like a Roman soldier of feathery plume, bronze body armor, and strutting around like he was in charge of the alley behind the high priest's house. That, however, was not the point. The point was that rooster wasn't supposed to be there. Chickens and their ilk were forbidden from the walls of Jerusalem. It was against Jewish custom for chickens and roosters to make their way into the city center. Therefore, as Utley notes, this couldn't have been a Jewish chicken. He must have been an unwelcomed Roman rooster. (laughs) All these sorts of details help us read the story anew. They help bring it to life again as we read it over and over again. And and this is what happened to me as I was wrestling with the text this week, because as I've, I've read each one of these denial accounts in the four Gospels, there was a sanitized version of Peter in my heart. This is not the way of the Gospels, but in my mind and in my heart, Peter had become very dull and sanitized. And it was distant from the original versions that we read in the Gospels. In fact, my sanitized Peter looks something more like this. There were those that came to question him. And as those come and ask Peter the question of his allegiances, I hear Peter definitively say, I don't know the man. But it was something ill-fitting. It it was something put on like a coat that was too large. Or or like this, that Peter, as Peter says, I don't know the man, it's, it's almost as if he has his fingers crossed behind his back saying, I don't really mean it. Or as Peter says, I don't know the man, maybe he's winking at the disciple on the other side of the courtyard. I guess in my sanitized version, I would, I would rather Peter be facetious in his denials that this would just be another one of Peter's many foibles. You see, that was what I was picturing as I was reading monotonously over and over again. But that's not what happened. It was much worse. This that we just read in John 18 is as bad as it gets. You see, as you weave together the four Gospels that give this account of Peter's denial. You notice something in Matthew and Mark that makes your stomach sink. They note that as Peter was denying Christ and saying, I don't know this man, they say that Peter was swearing and cursing. Meaning that Peter didn't just say, I don't know that guy and knock on wood. Peter was emphatic raising his voice to tones that only the guilty scream in. I swear to you, I do not know this pathetic man. Kill him like the criminal that he is. Now, we don't know exactly what all Peter said, but as the gospel accounts go, it was vile. It was marked by swearing and cursing, words that never should have come out of an apostle's mouth. You see, as we, we recognize Peter here, this, this is the, the Peter, one of the 12 that walked with Jesus for three years. There was not a single apostle that was closer to Jesus than Peter. Peter was right there every step of the way on the water. At the peak of the mountain, Peter was there. Jesus had an inner circle. 
Peter found his way in. Peter is named through the Gospels as a sort of de facto leader of the apostles so that when you tell the story of the incarnate Christ, Peter pops up everywhere. Even when you don't want him to, Peter is there. He was the closest person to Jesus' ministry. He had a front row seat to the whole thing. And in the most critical moments of Jesus' ministry, There's Peter, swearing and cursing him off. I hate Jesus. Execute that criminal. You see, Peter's foibles are looking more like a complete abandonment of the faith. This is where more of the details come in. More of those details that help us read these stories anew. You see, because it's at this point, as I remember the story, where I picture the Roman rooster piercing Peter's hearts with the most famous crow in human history. And then it's something like this. Maybe Peter hangs his head at the memory of Jesus' foreshadowing of this event. But that's not what happened. It was much worse than that. This was as bad as it gets. Luke tells us that as Peter is swearing and cursing, Jesus turns and looks at him. That as all this is happening, Jesus can hear it. Jesus is in the same area being interrogated by Annas. And while Jesus is being interrogated, he can hear Peter swearing him off. And the third time that Peter does this, over about the course of an hour, Jesus looks at him, and this flood of emotions overwhelms Peter when he locks eyes with Jesus. The synoptic gospels tell us that Peter then wept bitterly and there, there's something in the language there that it seems as though Peter broke maybe physically spiritually as if his knees buckled and he hit the ground as he wept you see this this wasn't just another one of Peter's foibles his life was over and as we think of these, these stories and these accounts, even as Peter is walking with Jesus towards the crucifixion, sin is everywhere. Peter's life is filled with sin. In much the same way that our lives are filled with the same kinds of sin. You know, it's interesting because as we tell the story of our lives, a similar, things happen, or a similar thing happens. As we tell the story of our lives and we recount that which has happened to us, we often sanitize it. We, we sanitize our sins. We smooth things over as we re retell the story so that the bad stuff isn't as bad as it once was. But there's sin there as bad as it gets. You know, for Peter, we, we can just take Peter, the, the week of the crucifixion, this one week, we see sin jumping up in, in every aspect of the story. As Jesus is walking to the cross, Peter's pride gets the, the best of him. He sticks out his chest telling Jesus that he will walk with him anywhere, even unto death, I am with you. And Jesus corrects him and says, no, you aren't. In anger, Peter grabs his sword. And in fear, he cuts off the ear of another one. And Jesus corrects him, even as he's fighting for Jesus. In our text for today, he swears and he curses that he doesn't know Jesus. And Jesus corrects him. John does give us an interesting note here that Peter may have had an extra helping of fear at play. 
If you look with me at our reverse text for this, this week, uh, John 18, verse 26, says this, one of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? You see, at this point, Peter's own unruly violence may have been catching up to him. He may be as fearful of getting caught in his own actions as much as he is getting caught as Jesus' companion. But this this all leads us home, that as we consider our own lives and this story that's being written of us this very week, we often want to curate all of these kinds of things out of the story. We, we want to erase the pride and the anger. We want to erase the fear and the violence, but it is there. It has crept into our hearts and our minds just as it is Peter. Even as we walk with Jesus, the pride and the fear and the hopelessness swells up within us. Envy, gluttony, lust, they show up in the dark alleys of our minds. And it's, it's typically our way to push this aside or, or to repress it, hoping that it all just goes away one day. Because if we genuinely consider the sin that has been left in our wake, all that will be left to do is to weep bitterly with Peter next to that fire. And many of us have found ourselves there. And when you find yourself here weeping bitterly because of your own brokenness, you're in good company because it's there in the middle of the night. If you look up, you'll find the eyes of Jesus staring back at you knowingly correcting and patiently restoring. Because as sinful as Peter was this week, Jesus was filled with mercy. You see, every time Peter sinned, even during Jesus' own trial, Jesus was there to correct Peter. And Jesus does that work. But, but I want you to note this. It, it's, it's not the correction that is the hope. What we recognize in the manger is, is this is the very reason that Jesus was born. To walk with us through these dark and painful nights. You see, Jesus came to conquer sin and death so that we might be saved in the bitterest moments of this life that we live. You see, it wasn't too many days later that Peter and Jesus would be back together. After the resurrection, we find Peter and Jesus having a conversation in John 21. And and Jesus comes directly to Peter And note this, Jesus wasn't coming to Peter in fury. He was coming to Peter in grace. And and in that moment, he's, he's reminding Peter of his purpose. He's reminding Peter of the work of the cross and why the cross had to happen. There's this threefold questioning that we read earlier in the service where Jesus is fully restoring Peter back to his call. If, if Jesus would have been of this world, he would have written Peter off as a traitor. You see, if, if, if Jesus had lived and operated in the ways of this world, we would have been handed over to destruction a long time ago. But the work of Jesus is to restore The the work of Jesus is is to to build you up and mend your heart. He's going to take the sin of your past and redeem it so that you can be made whole again. All of us walk into those bitter nights. Sin has taken us to depressing places. 
But the work of Jesus Christ is to pull you up and to pull you out, to renew and give you life again. In Jesus' mercy, we will find peace. This is the promise of the cross. See, everyone wants their heart to be whole. There is not a soul on the face of this earth that isn't seeking for their heart to be healed. All of us have known the broken heart that sin leaves behind. We want healing. We want wholeness. But there's only one person through which this comes. And it's important for you to acknowledge this sin and brokenness before the Christ. To let him come and to heal you. You see, this, this is why God sent Jesus. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Because you are like Peter. I am like Peter. And we cannot heal our own hearts. For as often as we have tried to heal our own hearts, we fall flat and we fail. Jesus is reminding us on the cross that you will never be able to sanitize the sin out of your life into something palatable. We can try, but we will fail. It's only Jesus who will bring restoration. And he is ready to restore you this morning. For you, for me, for Peter... Jesus will bring you up from your worst into the heavenly places of rejoicing. May we surrender and submit to that restoring Christ this morning. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we are grateful. The grateful people who have known the healing touch of a risen Savior. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would speak your truth into our hearts and for the darkness that hides. Lord, shine the light of holiness. We pray that you would rid us of sin and temptation. Bring us back from death and bitterness. Lord, turn our tears of mourning into tears of rejoicing. Let us together this morning experience the forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ at the cross. It's in his name, the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen.